In this section, we're going to discuss how prices move and who the players are behind it. When you understand how traders make prices move, then how you need to think to generate consistent results will start to become clear to you. Okay, where we're going now is that, is that I think what I said when we, you know, just before the break, is that when you guys understand the nature of price movement and how any technical methodology that's based on a mathematical formula or a price pattern interacts with that movement, when you understand that relationship, how you need to think will become self-evident. Do you remember me saying that? Okay, this is the part that we're going into right now, okay? In other words, where you understand just exactly how prices move. Because what I found in doing these workshops over the years, is that here I'm, I'm, I'm addressing a group of people who trade, and who in many cases have traded for years, and if you ask somebody exactly how do prices get from one price to the next, they can't tell you. They don't know. They don't know how it happens. And maybe you guys are, I'm sure you guys aren't, aren't that group. But we'll, you know what we'll do? We'll, we'll go over it just as a refresher, okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it as a kind of refresher. So... <laughs> Oh. No, actually, I haven't, I haven't addressed a group yet that, that there were very few people, or if anybody, could tell you exactly how prices move from one price level to the next. So, for an example, um, 10, 9, 7, 6, 11, 13. Okay. If the last reported price that you see on your screen of something is 10, how does it get to 11? They ask 12. What? They ask 12. Who's they? Uh, market maker. The market maker, market maker asks 12, okay. Well, no. Well, okay, it's at 10. How does it get to 11? How does the price actually move to 11? More buyers. More buyers. Well, more buyers, but... That okay, that's true. But then again, when you when you what's that? Demand. Demand. Okay, but when you look at ten, what you have is you have offers at eleven, and you have bids at nine. Right? Everybody understands that. Okay. Now, there's only two ways that anybody can make money in this business. There's only two possible ways, no matter what strategies you're employing, no matter how elaborate they are, no matter how simple they are. You have to be able to buy something at a low price and sell it back at a higher price, or sell something at a high price and buy it back at a lower price. Are we in agreement on that? And would you also agree that everyone that trades is trading to make money? In other words, I'm going to say that there isn't anybody who puts on a trade that does so knowingly and consciously thinking it's going to be a loser. In other words, when they go into the market and say, I, my purpose is to lose money. Okay, you guys with me on this? Now, if the only way that you can make money is to buy low and sell high or sell high and buy low, and the last price, posted price is 10, which represents the value at that moment, then what's low? Nine is low. And what's high? Eleven. What's the only way that it can get to eleven? Somebody, somebody, thinks, somebody thinks eleven's a good price, meaning that they have to buy high relative to the last price, right? So for an example, so, so basically what this also means is that, that all the offers have to be taken out at ten, do they not? Anybody who had an offer in at ten that wanted to sell at ten will get filled and all those offers have to be taken out for the price to go to 11. Correct? And of course, and for the price to go to 12, all the offers that exist at 11 have to be taken out so that someone could actually bid the price up to 12. For prices to move, somebody literally has to bid the market up. Or for prices to go lower, it means that someone has to offer it lower. Now, if the only way that anyone can make money is to buy low and sell high and sell high and buy low, why in the world would anybody 
bid the market past the last posted price. Conviction, exactly. Conviction. In other words, what you have is a situation where on every trade, every trade that exists, there are both there are two people on both sides of the trade, even in stocks. There are, there's even someone who's selling a stock, not like a commodity where, where in a futures contract or an options contract, there's two people on both sides of the trade. There's a buyer and there's a seller. And the next tick is going to make one of them a winner and one of them a loser. Right off the bat. If you and I, you and I enter into a trade at 10, okay? We enter into a trade at 10. It means that you, in essence, if you're the seller, let's say you... You sold them at 10 and I bought them at 10. The next tick is going to make one of us a winner and one of us a loser. If the next tick is 9, the amount of money that flows into your account is coming directly out of mine. Are you guys with me on this? If the next tick is 11, the amount of money flowing into my account is coming directly out of your account. Okay? So basically what you have is you have two diametrically opposing beliefs entering into every single trade. Every trade that is made, there are diametrically opposing beliefs about what the future is going to be. So again, I'm going to say, what would cause anybody to buy high or sell low? Just conviction. In other words, what you have is a situation where if someone's willing to bid a market up to the next highest price, basically what that person is doing is that person is stepping out saying that my conviction that the price is going to go to 12 or beyond is so great that I am willing to do the opposite of what I need to do to make money. Think about what I just said. I am willing to do the opposite of what I need to do to make money because my conviction is so strong that the next price will be 12 or 13. Otherwise, this person would wait. If this person thought the next price was going to be 9, then they'd buy lower. If they thought it was going to be 8, they'd buy low. They'd wait and buy lower. Whereas, so what happens is that the person who's willing to bid a market up and take out these offers at 10, take out all the offers at 10 and bid it up to 11, has to have a stronger conviction in the future than the person who sold it to him at 11. Because this person is creating price movement, is actually creating movement, and the person on the other side of the trade is being passive because they're doing exactly what they think they need to do, and that's sell high relative to the last price. Are you guys with me on this? Okay, everybody understand it? Now, I want to ask you, is there anybody in this room who has purposefully bid up a market? There are. There are some people who've actually bid a market up. In other words, the people who've actually taken, taken the offers, all the offers out at the next highest price and bid it up. Do people like that exist? Yes. So in other words, we are aware of the fact that there are traders who, have both, who both have the financial and the psychological resources to actually purposefully bid markets up or offer them lower. Are we, we're together on this, right? Okay. So basically what you have is that all price movement has to be a result of an imbalance in the degree of conviction between the traders who believe that prices are going up and those who believe that it's going down. That is the only way that prices move. It doesn't matter what the reasons are that people tell you about why they did what they did. Or it doesn't matter what the reasons that you hear on CNBC or whatever about where the market is and why it went the way that it went. Ultimately, it all boils down to an imbalance in conviction. That's the only way prices can move. Because the only way they can move is for someone to actually purposefully bid it up or offer it lower and for them to do it, there has to be, you know, like, like a, a sense of, of, of strength in terms of energy in their belief that the next tick is going to make them a winner. Okay, 
So we basically, does everybody understand? Everyone's with me on this. All price movement is, is a result of an imbalance in conviction between the buyers and the sellers. Every trade, every trade that's made, there's somebody on both sides of the trade that have diametrically opposing beliefs. You're always having, with every single trade, there's always a clash. There's always a clash in wills and a clash in belief in terms of what the next tick is going to be or what the future holds. We've got two people coming, entering into, in a sense, an agreement by making a trade, but both of those people have diametrically opposing expectations of the future. And one of them is willing to say, hey, you know what? My expectation is so great, is so strong, that I am actually willing to do the opposite of what I need to do to make money and bid a market up. Now, there are traders who will do that. I call them dynamic traders. They are the people that have, like I said, both the financial and the psychological resources to actually bid markets up. What the typical, and what I'm going to call everyone else, passive technical traders, okay, they've got dynamic traders and passive technical traders. What the typical passive technical trader doesn't really, I'd say, really not aware of or think about is the fact that the only way that they will find themselves in a winning trade is by the actions of the people who are willing to bid a market up and offer, offer it lower. That's the only way that it happens. In other words, when you and I get into a trade, and I am a passive technical trader, by the way. I'm not one of these dynamic guys. I don't bid markets up and offer them lower. Okay? That when you and I get into a trade, at this price right here, let's say we, got into the, we bought at 7. We're buyers at 7. What are we really saying when we get into that trade? Bottom line, what are we saying? Based on the dynamics of what I just explained. We're saying that I think that someone is going to come into the market after me and buy at a worse price than what I did. That, so, that has such a strong conviction that this market is going to go up, that that person is actually willing to buy at a worse price than me to buy at 8, to buy at 9, to buy at 10, because if there isn't anybody else that comes into the market to take out all the offers at 8, take out all the offers at 9, take out all the offers at 10, that market ain't going up. And I'm not going to be in a winning trade. You see, the implications are every single trade that we put on as passive technical traders, we are in fact obliged and dependent on other people who are willing to do something at a worse price than what we've done it, we did it at. Or we won't be a winner. Are you guys following me on this? Is it starting to put the idea of trading into a different context? That in essence, what you're really trading is other people's perception of what is high and what is low? That any technical indicator, any price pattern that you might trade, any trade that you put on, you are basically trading other people's perceptions of what is high and what is low. Now, when you think about how well you might know other people's perceptions, you think about it in that context, it might not make a lot of sense to get so fixated on staying in a trade that isn't working. It might be a little easier to put in a stop and to say, hey, you know what? If, they, if, these, if, the, if people aren't coming in to buy at a higher price than me, I'm going to give them this much room from here to here, and if they don't come in, I'm out of this trade. I'll just go to the next one. Because that's basically what you're doing as a trader. You are completely dependent on other, on other traders to make you a winner. Now, who are these dynamic traders? Who are the people that are going to do this, and why? What? Hedge funds, okay. Money managers. Uh, in the commodities arena, do you guys really know how like the futures markets even started in the first place? Or why they even exist? I know people probably exist because they're on the screen and it's part of the platform, but you know, there's actually a legitimate economic purpose for these things. And when you, when you get to the underlying, un, when you understand the underlying reason for these markets, you'll, you'll understand why they trade the way that they do and why prices move the way that they do. You know, for an example, what, you know, what, it really, what, what, what happened in the past is that, if, for an example, if you had a farmer who, uh, uh, you know, who planted their, their, their corn in the spring 
and harvested the, the corn in the fall, what they were dependent on, of course, was a lot of different factors that they had no control of, one of them being the weather and one of them being how much other, how much other corn was planted out throughout the country and how much of that corn would end up, end up in, in the market in the fall in relationship to what the demand was. So if there was a lot of corn and, and, and let's say, um, the demand remained relatively constant, the price of the corn would go down and the farmer would lose money. If there wasn't a lot of corn and demand would remain constant, the price would go up. If there wasn't a lot of corn and for some reason demand was really high and the price would go up even further. So what you had is a situation where there was a great deal of economic risk in, in being a farmer or being anybody that manufactured anything. Or, or dug stuff out of the ground like gold or silver or, or manufactured electric motors that needed copper or, or whatever goes into all the products that we use. So what, what evolved was a situation where the, the farmer and the, and the manufacturer, let's say, of bread that needed the flour, they would enter into what was called a forward agreement, meaning that they both wanted the economic risks taken out of their business. They both wanted to be able to make a profit. They both wanted, you know, to be able to, to have some sense of certainty as to what you know, prices might be at some point in the future. So, for an example, if... If I'm a farmer and it costs me $4 a bushel to plant my corn and bring it to harvest or bring it to market, then for me to, of course, for me to make some money, I want at least $5 a bushel, right? And if I'm the guy on the other end of that trade or the other end of that transaction that wants to buy that corn in the fall or wheat or whatever, and I want to know exactly how much I'm going to have to pay for it. So what ends up happening is that if, let's say, it's, it's April or it's, it's March and the price of corn is $4 a bushel, you enter into a forward agreement with, with, the, with the end user and they say, hey, you know what, I will deliver uh, a million dollars of, or a million bushels of corn or 100,000 bushels of corn at, at, say, four fifty dollars a bushel or whatever price they agree on or $5 a bushel, regardless of what the price of corn is in the fall. So if the price of corn in the fall happens to be uh, $3 a bushel because there's so much demand, or because there's, because there's so much corn and very little demand, then the farmer actually still got his price, at, let's say, at $5 a bushel, but the, but the manufacturer ended up having to pay $2 a bushel more than what he would have if he had waited and just bought his corn on the open market in the fall. So in that sense, he seemed to lose on that transaction. But then the next year, what ends up happening is that there's very little corn or there's more demand than what there is corn, and the price of corn ends up being $7 a bushel, and the farmer would have made the $7 had he not ordered, entered into a forward agreement, but what ends up happening is he still made his dollar a bushel profit, and the, and the end user ended up saving himself $2 a bushel. So over the years, all this evens out. Well, so then what happened then is that exchanges... In other words, instead of these, these people individually entering into these transactions, exchanges uh, were uh, uh, developed. So in other words, they had a central place to come to and make these transactions, like the Chicago Board of Trade and Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Well, what ended up happening is that when, with the advent of exchanges, what you had is a situation where there were people that were willing to take the other sides of these trades that had nothing to do with the actual process of making bread or growing wheat or corn. They were called speculators. And then that's when futures, futures contracts, you know, came into being. So what would happen is that, is that if I'm... If I'm a farmer, instead of me having to make the transaction directly with, a, uh, um, with someone who, who manufactures bread, I could go to the Chicago Board of Trade and sell my corn or wheat with a futures contract. And so if I'm selling it at $4 a bushel, and so that means I'm long corn. This is where the long and the short comes from. I am long cash. I'm long corn and because I've got a crop in, crop in the ground. And so if, um, if I sell it at $4 a bushel on a futures contract, I take the equivalent number of futures contracts. And so if the price of corn goes down, or let's say the price of corn goes up, I've already locked in, well, I'm going to sell it at $5, but I've locked in my dollar bushel profit. So if the price of corn goes up, what I've done is I'm short futures. I'm short the actual futures contract. I'm long the corn. So I'm going to lose money on my futures contract. 
because as the price goes up, I'm losing money, but I'm making money on my cash. So I'm making the equivalent amount of money on my cash as what I'm losing on my futures. So in any case, it doesn't matter what the market does. The market can go up, the market can go down. I've locked in my dollar profit bushel, dollar per bushel profit. And the person on the other side of that trade, the speculator, if, of course, the market goes up, then the speculator is the one that makes that $2 a bushel profit if it goes up to $7 a bushel. Okay? You guys with me on all this? If the price, of course, if the price of, 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 of it goes down, then I'm losing money I'm losing money on my cash crop, but I'm making money on my futures contract. And the speculator on the other side of the contract is losing money because the market's going down. In other words, the, the speculator is just one-sided. The farmer is two-sided. He is hedged. That's what's, that's what's called a hedge. Now, what's interesting about all this is that, is that as these markets evolved, you will find that, that the farmers don't trade against each other or the grain elevators, or the people who, the commercials who actually are involved with the production and manufacture of anything, they don't take the other side of each other's trades. What they do is they want speculators to take the other sides of their trades. In other words, if I'm a, if I'm a commercial grain elevator, I'm, I'm not going to be, that I'm, you know, another commercial grain elevator is not going to be taking the other side of my trade because we're both going to be doing the same thing. Okay, if I'm a farmer uh, and I'm going to sell, sell my wheat or sell my corn, the guy, the farmer down the street who also trades isn't going to be taking the other side of my trades. What, what commercials and hedgers and fund managers and all the people who are really, let's say, professionals, they have become very, very sophisticated at finding ways of drawing the general public into taking the other sides of their trades. Meaning, and the point that I'm making here, is that they will purposefully do things that will draw the typical general public, let's say, the general public into the other side of their trades when in fact what they want to do is the exact opposite. For an example, let's, uh, if, I'm, if, I'm a hedge fund, if I'm a hedge fund manager and, I wanna, and I'm long stocks or, or it doesn't really matter what it is, I could be long bonds, I could be long uh, gold, I could be whatever it is, and I want to I wanna liquidate my position. Now, I've got a huge position, meaning I've got a cash position and I want to sell it. If I go into the market right now and sell my entire position, what do you think is going to happen to the price? Chances are it's going to go down. I'm going to, I am actually going to, because of the volume of my trades, I am actually going to drive the price down, making my average cost lower and lower. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, so for example, if I come into the market and I say, hey, you know what, I've got uh, 10 million shares of this and that to sell, what's going to end up happening is that those 10 million shares are going to end up taking out all the bids, all the, all the prices down, take out all the bids until you find a spot where it can't take out, where the, where the size of the trade cannot take out any more bids and the price stabilizes. Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, now, what you get is you've you got these, what I'm going to call like these, these hot, shot, hot shot kind of uh, uh, hardcore traders where, you know, to make a name for themselves because they're in a, they're in a big trading room and they, they compete amongst one another and their bonuses depend on how well they do. What, they're, it'd be, what, if, what if they did something like this? I'm looking at a price chart. Let's just say they could be daily bars or whatever. Okay. And this is like a swing high, swing low, okay? Now, interestingly enough, as we're talking about this, I want to make a point about what does, this, what does this price represent right here? And what does this price represent right here? What? Yeah, we're going to call it resistance, but, but, but more from a practical matter, what does it represent? What's that? Nobody believes it's going to go higher. Ah, yeah. In other words, there wasn't, now, you're right. He said, he said there's nobody believes it's going to go higher. It represents there wasn't one person in the whole world, in the whole world, that was willing to bid it, bid the price one tick higher. 
Not one. Up to this point, there could be any number of people who were willing to bid it higher. But it got to a certain price level, and there wasn't one person left in the whole world that would bid it higher. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why technical analysis works, is because the market has a memory. This is why technical analysis works. The market has a memory. Because when the market came back down, he formed a swing low, came back up to this high, there were people, there were people who made money by selling this high. There's a good chance those same traders are going to come back into the market and do it again. As well as there are people who lost money by buying that high. Because for every trade that was made up to this last price, there was a buyer and a seller. There was a trader on the other end of the trade that sold, that bought that high. Now when the market comes back again to, this, to the same price level, chances are there will be an imbalance between the buyers and the sellers. Just by the mere fact that the people who made money are going to be willing to trade it again and come into the market maybe with a, with a lot of ferocity. And the traders who lost money by buying that high are probably not going to be willing to do it again. And so what you have is even more of an imbalance that existed the last time. Are you guys with me on this? I'm waiting for it to break through. Okay, well that's fine. You can do that. However, No, I'm not going to really get, I'm just, the most I'm going to do is get into what we're just doing right now because this is not, you know, this is not a course in technical analysis. I mean, it, and, and it doesn't really matter anyway because you guys are trading off of mathematical formulas and, and not doing subjective trading. So, and this would fall into the category of subjective trading. Subjective trading also is, is the equivalent to, uh, like, uh, like who, who watches uh, Texas Hold'em tournaments, like on TV? Anybody, come on, give, give me more of a show of... So, so, you've got, so you've got categories of development where, where initially people, when, when they play Texas Hold'em, you play your cards, and then you get well enough, you get good enough at playing your cards, what you start doing is playing the people, and you get good enough, you get so good that you don't even have to play your cards, you don't even have to look at your cards, you just play the person. That's the equivalent to subjective trading, okay? What you're doing is, you, is you're using a process of deductive reasoning to determine who's thinking what and what they're likely to do, Okay? And all, the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm giving you all this information and making this point is so that you understand with, with no uncertain terms that there are as a whole category of traders out there, people out there, traders, people who have both the financial and the psychological resources to bid markets up and offer them lower. And what's the point that I'm making? The point that I'm making is that any particular technical methodology that you use to determine a pattern is present that gives you a higher probability of one thing happening over another, until you can get into the minds of the people who actually move prices, you will never know for sure what's going to happen next. The only people that know for sure are the people who are willing to do it. And that's what you've got to, you've got to burn that in your brain. You will never know for sure what's going to happen next. Unless you can read the minds of the people who are going to do it. And there are people who will do it. And they do it all the time. That's the only way you end up in a winning trade. Most of the time when you end up in a winning trade is because of what these other dynamic traders are doing. So to convince you that there are people who are willing to do this, if I'm a hedge fund manager and I've got to unload, if I've got to unload a huge position and the market happens to be sitting right here in, in relative to this chart pattern, how might I maximize my profits? What might I do? Now remember, I've got to sell. I'm going to be a seller. But what might I do to make sure that I get the best price? Drive what? Drive it up and sell. Yeah, drive it up. In other words, I will do the opposite of what I want to do to get a better price. And I will drive it up. But how much risk am I taking by doing that? Well, yeah, I mean... If I drive the price up by taking out these offers and then bidding up, taking out an offer, take, in other words, I can look with, with, depending on the kind of software I have, I can find out what depth, uh, the depth of the market, meaning that, that, you know, and I'm not saying these are hard, hard offers because people pull their offers all the time, but I can look at this, I can look at this high and I say, you know what, what if, how much money might it take for me to drive the market from here to just past these highs right here? 
How many offers do I have to take out to do it? Just tally it up. Just tally it up and see if you want to spend the money. Because in essence, how much risk are you actually taking? See, by, by, by driving it up, what you're doing is you're, you're increasing the asset value of your portfolio. So in that sense, you're not taking any risk. You're actually making money. If I, if I continue to drive the price up, I am actually making the trades that I made down here winners. Every tick that I drive the price up, I'm making myself a winner on the trades that I made at lower prices to actually drive a price up because you are making yourself a winner at the prices that, you know, what you bought at lower prices. If, for an example, by me driving this price up, it draws other people into the market, that will help, will it not? Because it creates more of an imbalance. Now, that's the real thing. What I want to do is I want to get more buyers into the market. And the reason why I want to get more buyers into the market is so somebody is there to take the other side of my sell orders. Because that's ultimately what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is I want to sell. So what I'm doing is creating a bigger pool of, 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 of orders to come into the market so I can sell into so that my, my sell orders don't drive the price down. down. And so I will purposefully do the opposite of what I want to do, ultimately, with respect to my position. Now, what, the reason why I'm selling has nothing to do with this chart pattern. Absolutely nothing to do with the chart pattern itself. I'm just using the chart pattern as a means to maximize my profits. Now, what if I managed to drive it up to resistance? Chances are there's going to be a lot of sell orders coming in that I'm going to have to compete with. That's, that's a risk, that, I, that's a risk that, I, that, I'm, that I'm taking here. But what if I can drive it a little past that resistance? What I'm going to have is a situation where all the people, the other traders who sold at this level right here that came into the market because it was approaching this previous high, they're going to put their stops a little bit above the market. Now, what kind of stops are they going to be? They're going to be buy stops. If they sold to get out at a loss, they have to be buyers. If I can drive the market to those buy stops, I have given myself an instant pool, an instant pool of orders to take the other side of my trades and, and get me out at, at maximum profits. This is typically what you see in a chart pattern as a false breakout. Because what will end up happening is that as soon as my order hits the market, it's so large, and, the, and the, because there really weren't a, that many other traders that were willing to bid, continue to bid the market up, what it'll do is it'll take out all the bids and then drive the price right down. That's called a false breakout. It's, it's being done at different, at different uh, time frames all of the time. To do this, you have to have a large enough position so that when you drive up your cost basis, it's incrementally small compared to where you really are today. Yeah. And then, as you said, you get up to either you do it below that resistance, hope you break above, and then you just dump your shares. Right. Right. Thank you. Now, like I said, th this is, did, did, did anybody ever wonder why, like, uh, like you, you have a really strong bull market or a really strong bear market, and the market seems to open up in the morning, like in bull markets it opens lower and bear market opens higher? Like, why does that happen? Well, what's the deal with that? What do you think is going on? You ever heard the term? shaking out the weak longs and the weak shorts. That's, that's, what, that's what dynamic traders are doing. They're shaking out the weak longs and the weak shorts. In other words, they're taking their spot. Because what you have in a bull market is you have, you know, people that, you know, the market's going up. This is, this is a daily bar, but if we made it an intraday bar or whatever, as the market is going up, they're buying, people are buying, but they're not, they're not like really confident about what it is that they're doing. Now, in the morning, before the market opens, there might not be that many bids. In other words, if the, after the market opens, there'll be more bids that come into the market. But before the market opens, there might not be that many bids. So, what, so if there aren't, what these dynamic traders to, will do to take advantage of this is they'll hit those bids. In other words, they'll sell. They'll sell into those bids, drive the market down, and then when the market opens up, all of the weak longs, meaning people who aren't that confident, will we'll start, we'll start to get a little frightened 
And to get out of their position, what do they have to do? They have to sell, and these other dynamic traders will take the other side of their sell orders to buy and increase their position, and the market goes right straight back up. All they did was shake these guys out, take their spot at lower prices by, by, by forcing the market lower on the open. Go ahead. Isn't this an argument to have a to either not use? Let's talk. No, 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 no. It is not. No, you know I don't want to get. I don't want to get into the use or not. Absolutely, use stops. I'm not going to. We're not going to get into that. We're yes. You as, as mechanical passive technical traders in the mechanical mode. Uh, this is not in any way saying that you should not use stops. Absolutely, it's a disastrous thing to do. Not use stops. Okay, because I'm not saying that regardless of any of this, that you can't make money. You, I'm giving, all I'm doing is giving you examples that there are people out there who will drive prices up and offer them lower, that they have the psychological and financial resources to do it. And the reason why I'm spending, you know, making so much emphasis is that the passive, the passive, typical passive technical trader would never conceive of, of actually bidding a market up. And so as a result, it's very difficult for you to think that anyone else can do it either when the reality is that's the only way in many cases you're going to make money. And so the point that I'm making is that what you, you're trading off of a mathematical formula. Literally, you're trading, you're, and this mathematical formula, what technical analysis does is it gets into the collective mind of the market. In other words, every tick, every uptick and every downtick is information. That information is accumulated and mathematical principles are applied to it. There are, there are actual patterns that, that, that emerge, that repeat themselves over and over and over again, that you can identify with mathematical formulas or with these visual price patterns. But the problem is, is that there's no mathematical formula that can get into the mind of the individual traders who actually are driving prices up or offering them lower. But if you don't know that, you somehow or another, if you happen to, if you're trading on a smaller time frame, you're trading on a smaller time frame and you get a, a, little, uh, a little pullback right here, okay? And based on that pullback, your methodology says, okay, it's time to buy. And you do. And, but, and you do it just before this hedge fund manager comes in and starts driving the price up. See, you're going to think that the reason why you won is because that your mathematical formula told you what was happening next. And that was the reason why it happened. What I'm saying to you now is that there almost isn't any reason that you could come up with, whether you won or lost, that would correspond to what really happened in the market. Do you hear what I just said? There's almost no reason that you will come up with to put on a trade that will ever correspond with the actual reason why the market went up or the market went down other than the fact that there was an imbalance in conviction between buyers and sellers. Because the people who do this will not tell you unless it's in their best interest to do so. And the reason the people who report it in the news agencies, they don't know either. They're making it up. They make up the reasons because they sound reasonable. They are paid to sound reasonable. And there's no way to verify what it is that they say. That's right. There's no, there's no way. The only people who can do it are the people who actually made the trades. The only people who know for sure what's going to happen next are the ones who are willing to make it happen. You see, we'll put on a trade and find ourselves in a nice monster little winner here and think, oh man, my, my methodology, it is just fantastic. And then the next time you get the same signal, and then you don't get anything. Not only that, it's a loser. You think, oh, now you feel betrayed. You think your, your methodology let you down. Your methodology wasn't designed to tell you what's going to happen next on a trade-by-trade -trade basis. No technical methodology is. That's where your expectations are not in line with the reality of the situation. That's why it's so easy to make mistakes. It's because you're expecting something from your methodology that just doesn't exist. It just doesn't. It never did. On a trade-by-trade -trade basis. They will tell you what will happen 
let's say, I don't want to use the words to happen next. They'll tell you what will happen over a series of trades on a percentage basis. This particular pattern will emerge X number of times, and when it does, there's a higher probability of this happening than that. If I limit my risk when I take the trade and my, profits, uh, my profit potential is at least you know, one or two or three times greater than what I need to risk, then over a series of trades, I will be a consistent winner. That's what trading is all about, guys, as a passive technical trader. Unless you're doing this other stuff, I just said it right then and there. I said it all right then and there. There was a guy that I, the guy that, I, uh, guy that came to me for, for consultations uh, uh, several years ago. Um, he was a, uh, uh, he wasn't really anything. He, he, was, he was a guy that, yeah, he, <laughs> he, he was a guy that lost a lot of people's money. He was basically what he was. He, he, uh, uh, he was actually, he was a really good anal analyst, I, I should say. Really, he, he, was, he was an excellent analyst. In fact, as far as, as far as market analysis was concerned, he was probably one of the best analysts I'd ever worked with. But the problem is that he had some really, as far as executing his trades, and, and uh, let's put it this way, he, he was, let's say, on the arrogant side. And that's, and that's, and that's, and that's, being, that's, that's being nice. And so when he put on a trade, he just thought that that was it. You know, the market was going to do what he thought it was going to do, period. So he, he was the kind of guy who, you know, he, he went through all of his, re his relatives' money with trading accounts and his friends and that sort of thing. And he was getting to the point where he was really exasperated. So he, he came to me for consultations. And basically after listening to him, I said, hey, you know what? Why don't you do something, get paid for something that you're good at and, you know, and stop trying to, you know, stop losing other people's money and go get a job as an analyst. Just get paid to be an analyst, not as a trader. And so he did. He got a job with, a, uh, with one of the major clearing firms at the Chicago Board of Trade as one of their analysts for their brokers and that sort of thing. And uh, the president, or the, actually the chairman of the board, he was, his son was actually the president. He chairman had retired. He was an old-time grain trader, soybean trader. And, uh, you know, made his money in the 40s and the 50s and that sort of thing. And, and traded pit-style trading. In other words, it's something that I talked about earlier this morning I'm not going to get into. But in any case, he didn't make direction-related trades. And so, the, so he was really mystified with, this, with the idea of technical analysis. I mean, he really was. He was literally mystified with the idea that you could basically predict prices based on chart patterns and that sort of thing. So he thought, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to sit down with this guy and, you know, this, this star analyst here that we have in the firm now and find out what this, what, what this crap is all about, basically, is the way he thought about it. And um, so he's, he's sitting down with him for a few days, and uh, it got to a point where one day um, you know, the, the soybean market was... Uh, The soybean market was, was basically, you know, trading in a range, about the middle of a range between what the analysts projected as the high of the day. Not just the high, the high of the day and the low of the day, okay? And so the market drifted around, you know, or, you know maybe did a little bit of a close to a test of the high. And it's coming down, to the, coming down to the low. And they're both sitting there and they're both watching it right now. And the, the chairman of the board, the soybean trader, old soybean trader, says, okay, so this is going to be the low of the day right here, right? The guy said, yep, that's it. Gets that price, it's the low of the day. Low of the day. And the guy looked at him and he said, that's bull. And he picked up the phone, which had a direct line to the soybean pit. He said, sell 10 million beans at the market. Now, 10 million beans is 2,000 contracts because they trade in 5,000 5, bushel increments. So he hit the market at that moment with 2,000 sell orders, okay, which drove the, immediately drove the price down 10 cents, which basically is a, is a million dollar trade, by the way. He, he, driving the price, of course, of course if, he'd got, if he'd have sold all of them at this price and bought them all back at this price, but they were, he was, they were, it, there was an average price down, but from here to here is, 10 mil, is a million bucks on 2,000 contracts. And then after the price dropped, he, you know, he, he looked at him and said, hey, if I can do that, anybody can do that. If I can do that, anybody can do it. Now think about the implications of what I just said. If you remember back in that survey that we just took a little while ago and I said, it only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your edge? Oh, gee, what if you're one of the people that bought right here? How many people did it take to mess up your trade? 
Just one. Just one person. That's all. It's usually more than one, but that's all it takes is one. You guys starting to get the idea? This kind of stuff is going on all of the time. As a matter of fact, when prices move, this is usually the reason why. When I was at Merrill Lynch, I mean, this is, I mean, you know, and for many years, even when I was teaching, teaching, you know, material in the psychology of trading, I didn't really include a lot of this stuff because I just sort of took it for granted that people understood it and knew it. You know, and the reason why I took it for granted is because I guess I learned it so early in my trading career that it just, you know, it was self-evident to me. But it was self-evident because here I was at Merrill Lynch and, and I, had, I had access to a squawk box. Now our squawk boxes were open phone lines to the various pits in both Chicago and New York, meaning we had Merrill Lynch representatives in each of those pits that as, as buy and sell orders would come in, they would tell us who was buying and who was selling. What houses, what manufacturers, what big accounts, what big traders, if they could. In other words, if they, had, if they had access to the information, they would tell us who was buying, you know, and, and, and maybe who was even taking the other side of their orders if, if they could determine it. So it's like it, you had a very intimate, it was like, a, you know, you had this sort of intimate um, connection with what was really going on. Now, at the same time, I, when I was doing my own technical analysis, I would do, I would do my equations because we didn't have computers back then. Of course, you could do the, the Hewitt Packard the handheld thing, but I didn't do that. I did all my equations on a, all my analysis on a spreadsheet, and I actually did all the all the calculations by hand, and I did it on purpose that way so that I could get an intimate sense of how the actual mathematics of my signals, in other words, the actual calculations, the multiplications, the divisions, the subtractions, you know, and what the, what the final product was in terms of a signal, how it related to the actual market movement. And I found that there was no relationship other than the fact that it would identify patterns where the signals would work sometimes and, you know, sometimes they wouldn't. But the point is, is that there wasn't any relationship between this fixed mathematical formula and the people who were buying and selling at that moment and the reasons why they were doing it. There was none at all. But not only that, here's what really shocked me. Is we had uh, a TV monitors going all the time. And we had it on, uh, in Chicago, there was a, a local investment channel, Channel 26. And it was very much like CNBC now, but it was a lot less sophisticated. And, you know, so we'd watch as, as people would come on the show and, uh, and with various, you know, have various interviews and that sort of thing. And I'm watching, watching one morning, and there's this vice president from Heinhold, which is, now doesn't exist anymore, but they were one of the biggest hog and, and meat producers in the Midwest back in the 80s. And uh, this, this vice president from Heinhold is being interviewed by, you know, the guy on Channel 26. And he's talking about how, you know, how uh, people got to people got to get into live hogs and pork bellies because prices are going up. And, you know, and he's just going on and on about what a great investment it is. And, and really, and, and here, and this would happen quite frequently, by the way, but this was just an example. And then all the phones started lighting up. These are all the people in the Chicago area, the typical, you know, the traders in the Chicago area that are listening to this guy because I, because I say that because the phones are lighting up and all the brokers are starting to take orders to, to, uh, uh, to buy bellies and buy hogs. And I'll think, well, you know, that was pretty, pretty impactful, right? Oh, gee, then on Squawk Box, guess who's taking the other side of those orders? Heinhold. <laughs> they needed somebody to come in and take the other side of their orders. What does a mathematical formula have to do with that? Now, as it just so happens, if my math is working in a way where I happen to get in at that moment, I end up in a winning trade, well, that's great. But that doesn't mean I can rely on, rely on it to do the same thing the next time. Uh, okay, I explained hedging, reverse auction. In a normal auction, this is what I'm talking about dynamic traders right now. In a, in a normal auction, what do people do in a normal auction? In other words, if you're in, in a situation where, where things or items are up for bid, when you bid, when you're outbidding somebody, what are you doing? You're eliminating the competition, right? In other words, by bidding higher, you're hopefully eliminating anybody else who will bid higher than you. 
hedgers and commercials and dynamic traders create what I call a reverse auction. They'll bid a market up or offer it lower to try to attract the public into the market to take the other side of their trades. You guys with me on this? They will bid a market up or offer it lower as a reverse auction. That doesn't mean that they want the, they, you know, they could, the market can go higher, but their, their immediate objective is that if they're bidding it up, it means that they want to sell. They just want someone to take the other side of their trades. So they're actually creating a reverse auction, attracting people into the market. Because as the market goes up, the people are thinking, okay, I'm going to be missing out. And, and I've got the assurance that I need that it's going to keep on going. And so they get sucked into this move. And then, and then they slam them with a huge order. Now, see, I had intimate contact with all of that Merrill Lynch. <laughs> I really, you know, <laughs> not only that, I mean, cause, because I knew the floor traders, I knew many of the floor traders who actually created the movement that particular day. And there were a number of times where the movement was significant and they were fast markets and, you know, enough to attract the, the media to the exchange. And, you know, and they put a microphone in front of their, in front of their mouth and, you know, and the, I definitely, they definitely would say something that was palatable to the public. In other words, what was reasonable, I can guarantee you that the reason why they did what they did during the day had nothing to do with what they said. Nothing. There was no relationship whatsoever. Go ahead. I fully understand your concept of the, the movement that's taking place because of dynamic players. And I can understand how that would relate to the commodity, stock, and stock options market. But can you have the same effect in, say, the foreign currency market, where it's a much bigger market that's traded worldwide? It, it just depends on the player. Absolutely. You get a central bank that starts, that starts, doing, that starts unloading something, and, and they're gonna, it's going to have a, a major impact on the market, yes. But, you, but, yeah, you've got basically what you have is a situation where, where this market's so large it's so liquid that it, is, it would be very difficult for individuals to have any impact on it. Is that what you're saying to me? Is that what you're... Well, I wasn't necessarily limiting it to individuals. I mean, even a central bank um, it just, on, on the world market, could they have that kind of an impact? Well, it's what I call the pebble in a pond effect, okay? They might not have enough, they might not have enough impact initially, Okay, initially to, to, to do something, okay, to have, to have that meaningful, make, to create that meaningful of a price move, but you've got a pebble in a pond, which is the way a lot of prices move anyway, because it's like what you've got is you drop a pebble in a pond, well, if it's, you know, it creates waves, does it not? Okay, and what I found is that, especially with floor traders, and, 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 and really the kind of same, the kind of same, the, the same kind of dynamics work even, uh, uh, even with off-the-floor traders in the general market itself, I found that what you had is that most floor traders did not know what they were doing in the sense that they didn't have a real good reason for buying or selling at any given moment other than the fact that they were following the lead of other people who thought they thought did have an idea of what they're doing. So what ends up happening is that, is that what you've got is you've got the, the guy, the trader who's confident, knows exactly what he's doing, why he wants to do it, and does it. And then you've got, you've got all the other guys who are, let's say, in the pit, okay, who are closest to this particular, this, this guy might be on this step right here, who are closest to this guy that will, that will mimic what he does. And then what it does is it starts spreading out. And that, and that as, as word gets out, okay, the guys at the farthest end end up getting prices that are, that are greatly diminished in relationship to this particular individual. But the point is it's kind of like the pebble in a pond. A central bank could create, create the same thing. In other words, initially, a central bank hitting the market with a huge order m might be absorbed, but the fact that the central bank is doing it will cause other people to want to do it too, and therefore, as a result of all the other traders who pile on, it creates a huge move. Does that make sense? Okay, we're moving right along here. Okay, dynamic traders, okay, players, they know and understand the mindset and behavior patterns of the crowd or herd. They, they, they basically refer to the general public as the herd, and they are the herd masters. 
Okay, they are the herd masters. Whenever possible, they will use that knowledge to move prices in a way that will extract the most amount of money from the largest number of traders. That is their mission. That is what they do. Characteristic of passive technical traders, they're usually mystified by price movement. Would that be a fair characterization? Okay, they wouldn't think about trying to cause price movement. As a result, they typically can't conceive of anyone else doing it either. They're typically drawn into trades based on an opinion about the attractiveness of the price or stampeded out because of fear. The passive technical trader's objective is to find himself in a winning trade without any intent to move prices. Now think about what you're doing. You are trading in a way where you want to find yourself in a winning trade but absolutely wouldn't even think about moving prices to do it. You're completely dependent on someone else doing it for you. To find himself in a winning trade, he's dependent on other traders to be willing to either buy or sell at a worse price than himself to create movement in his direction. The typical passive technical trader is expecting other dynamic traders to make him a winner when they usually have little or no knowledge, insight, or understanding about how dynamic traders operate. Would that be fair? The typical passive trader does not realize it only takes one dynamic trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of his edge. Is that a fair statement now? Does anybody want to argue with the statement anymore? Or, and I would say anybody did in the first place, but there are some people who raised raise their hand and said that that wasn't the case. Is there anybody that, that's not convinced about this? Seriously, I want to know. And I'm not, we're not going to get into a fight or anything, but you know. <laughs> okay, the characteristics of technical analysis. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take what we now understand about the nature of price movement and look at the nature of technical analysis to see, just see what we got here, okay? <laughs> see how well it, you know, it meshes. Okay, technical indicators define, identify, and organize market data, the up and down ticks into understandable patterns. Are you guys with me on this? The patterns are observ observable, quantifiable, meaning they can be measured and repeat themselves with statistical reliability. And, and, and really, and while I'm doing this, and while we're going through this, I want you guys to really keep in mind that, that just because I explained the, the underlying characteristics of dynamic traders and people who can actually move the market and do it, and do it all the time, in fact, when the market's moving, they're the ones who are doing it. It's not you or I. The only time you or I move the market is when there's an overabundance of market orders coming into the market from passive technical traders. Because a market order does what? Okay? If the last, again, the last price is 10, we've got 9, we've got 11. Okay, what's the market? The last price is 10. If I want to buy, the market's actually 11, isn't it? That's the market because that's where the offers are. The offers are at 11, so that's where I'm going to get filled. I'm going to get filled at 11. Well, if there's so many buy orders, come market buy orders coming into the market, and all the, all the offers are taken out at 11, then that means the next price up where there's offers are 12, and that's where I'm going to get filled. And if there's so many more that got in before me, and this is real, I mean, it's really an overabundance, of buy orders in relationship to the number of offers that, are, that, that exist, then I might get filled at 13 because that's the market. So that's the difference. You've got, you've got an overabundance of, of passive technical orders coming into the market that will drive it up, or you've got dynamic traders who are doing it purposefully. And when they're doing it purposefully, I guarantee you, they got, they got a good reason for it. They know what they're doing. I'm not saying it always works, but they know what they're doing. And it doesn't mean that you can't take advantage of it. It doesn't mean that you can't make a consistent income, even a, a, I mean a, a, really, a really good consistent income with your technical methodologies. You don't, you don't even have to, you don't have to understand all these, these uh, subtle dynamics or, of market or price movement to be able to take advantage of, of it. All you've got to do is be able to trade your edge and follow your plan. I just want you to understand that when you understand what's going on, you will, will be able to trade your plan because you won't be putting so much emphasis on things that don't have any relevance. Like expecting this next trade to work just because you got a signal. 
is this what drives the price up uh, typically early in the morning like when the market opens some popular stock all the market all the orders come in or it goes down and is that what creates this gap or well, I can't tell you the. I mean, when you say what that's what happens, I mean, all you can let's is put it, it this a, way: is it a log jam? It, like you can you can always break it down to one fundamental reason. The only fund, the only reason that that really there is, there's an imbalance mm-hmm. between between buyers and sellers. Price movement is always the result of an imbalance, because when there's balance, there's no movement. Right. It's that simple. Right. If there's balance, there's no movement. Prices do not move when there's balance. There has to be an imbalance for people to bid it up or offer it lower. And if people aren't actually bidding it up in this example, we don't. See, what I, what the reason why I can't a- answer you exactly is because I don't know if it's actually being bid up purposefully by somebody or, or it's because there's an overabundance of buy orders in relationship to the amount of offers. That's what I don't know. Okay? The, pa- the patterns basically measure the collective mind of the market. In other words, here, and I, should have, and I should have really emphasized this word, collective, collective mind of the market. Not the individual minds, the collective mind. Meaning all of the actions, all of the beliefs, all of the agendas, all of the objectives are built into that next incremental price change from 11 to 12 or from 12 to 13. It's all there. And the only thing that mathematical formulas can do is actually measure that, you know, measure the patterns that result from that information. It isn't getting the information of the guy who actually bid the market up by taking out all the offers because he's got some specific agenda about what he wants to do with where he wants to see the prices go. Because he's, he's doing something that has nothing to do with any of this, meaning your technical methodology or anybody else's. He might be putting on a huge hedge position based on some contract that he has to deliver something three months from now. So collective mind of the market, indicating when there is a higher probability of one thing happening over another, represented as an edge. So because the patterns show up in every time frame, technical analysis turns the market into an unending stream of opportunities to enrich ourselves. These patterns that the mathematical formulas identify show up in every time frame, from the smallest to the largest. And as a result, if we learn how to think about these patterns or edges appropriately, it will actually turn the market into an unending stream to enrich ourselves. But not on a trade-by-trade basis. But not on a trade-by-trade basis, but rather as a percentage over a series of trades. This is big, guys. This is it right here. This is the holy grail of technical analysis right here, right now. Your technical indicators will turn the market into an unending stream of opportunity to enrich yourself, but not on a trade-by-trade basis. But rather as a percentage over a series of trades. That means you have to learn how to think in probabilities. You may understand the concept of probabilities, it doesn't mean that you can think that way. I've worked with traders. In fact, one guy came to one of my workshops many years ago, a hedge fund manager, reasonably successful, you know, let's say reasonably because he made, you know, I don't know, 10 to 18% a year. But his indicators, if he had followed them the way, you know, the way they were planned to be followed, he could have made anywhere from 60 to 70% a year. A little frustrated, came to a workshop, and then, you know, some, some consultations afterwards. And one particular situation where he said, you know, he, he put in a trade, a trade he'd been watching for months, finally got to his price level. You know, he put the trade on, then put a stop in the market. You know, and the market started approaching a stop, and, you know, he, he, got out of, he got out of the trade early. The market didn't even hit a stop. He got out of the trade early, and then it just... Pfft, when just just fell to pieces because he was short and he, you know in his direction he wasn't in the trade 
And he would have been someone who would have said that he understood the nature of probabilities because he majored in it in college. But he, hadn't, he, he did not do the sufficient amount of work to train his mind to think in probabilities at a functional level. There's a huge difference. You can't take it for granted that because you understand the nature of percentages that you can think that way at a functional level. It would be, you know, like you can, you can do, I'll do the analogy to technical analysis to uh, flipping a coin, okay? That if you, if you take an evenly weighted coin and flip it a thousand times, You've got a large sample size there, right? The pattern that will emerge with each thousand flip sample size is a relatively even distribution between heads and tails. Maybe not quite 50-50, but let's say 49.2 and, you know, uh, 49.8 or something, whatever. There might be a little bit of variance, more variance there. But in any case, that will be a pattern. See, that's a pattern. Because it'll happen every single time you flip the coin a thousand times. But within that thousand flip sample size, is there any way, since you're going to get an even distribution between heads and tails, is there any way that you can know for sure which individual flip is going to be heads and which individual flip is going to be tails? No. You could get ten flips of heads in a row and be absolutely positive, the next one's going to be tails, and it can come up heads again. And even though you can have all these streaks of heads and tails, in the end, they're still going to come up 50-50. This is exactly the way technical analysis works, exactly. When you consider the diversity, the diversity of the market, with all the different players and all the different agendas from people all over the world trying to predict what will happen next would be almost equivalent to sitting in front of a slot machine and coming up with some rational reason why you think that the, the pattern that you're looking for is going to come up on the next push of the button. It wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? But the reason why it's, we get fooled as traders and we think of it in, a, in, 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 not this, in not this probabilistic way is because when we put on a trade, we put on a trade for a reason. See, reasons are important in our lives. Reasons are important. We put on a trade for a reason. And see, the problem is, is that when the trade works, we think our re we just naturally think our reason was right. What I'm trying to do here is help you disconnect, is disconnect any reason that you put on a trade with the reason why it actually moved. Because like I said before, there's almost never a relationship. There's almost never a correlation. And so the next time that reason seems to appear in the market, we're going we're gonna to do the same thing, thinking we'll get the same result. And then when we don't, we feel betrayed. And then the next time the reason comes up, we're going to be a little hesitant. And we might not put it on at all. We'll try to find additional reasons why this trade will work. When the reality is there isn't any reason you're going to be able to come up with that's going to assure you of anything. Unless the reason you're coming up with is you know the people who are actually going to bid the market up or offer it lower. And they tell you what they're going to do and why. Ultimately, there's only one reason why markets, why prices move. And what would that reason be? Come on. Yeah, an imbalance in conviction. That's the only, and what technical analysis does is it finds patterns in that imbalance, okay? Technical analysis finds in patterns in the imbalance. 
where there's momentum in a direction. It's still not going to tell you what's going to happen next. Technical analysis doesn't, nor can it, get into the minds of any particular individual trader who has both the financial and psychological resources to either move prices or defend certain price levels. And traders will defend price levels, by the way. There are dynamic traders who will actually defend a price. Is it reasonable to expect the fixed criteria that make up a mathematical formula to stay, to stay consistent with a dynamic event that's in perpetual motion on a trade-by-trade -trade basis? What's the answer to that? No. Well, what is the answer? No. Come on. No. no. No, it is not reasonable. No, it is not. especially where that motion is being caused by traders all around the world with differing beliefs, objectives, and agendas. There was no way of determining the intentions of all these traders, yet the typical passive trader trades their methodology as if they are being told what those intentions are. The professionals do not. You guys get that? The typical passive technical trader trades their methodology as if they are being told what their intentions are, whereas the professional does not. And why doesn't the professional? Because the professional understands the underlying dynamics of price movement and that anybody could come into the market at any time to do anything. There was another floor trader that I worked with who executed, uh, traded his own account in the soybean market, but also, also executed the orders for one, at the time, one of the biggest soybean uh, producers in the world. There was an Italian firm that actually tried the corner of the soybean market and got thrown off the board of trade. But before that happened, you know, there was many days where, you know, they, he would call, you know, be in touch with the, the head traders at the home office, and they're plotting out their strategy. And like, you know, he told me one day, you know, it's like, like the whole strategy for that day from the home office traders, the whole strategy was to spank the locals at the Chicago Board of Trade. That was their only purpose that day. They were going to suck the locals into a trade, and they were going to try to wipe them out. So he said, we're going to spank the locals today. Now, your mathematical pattern, okay, you happen to get a buy signal, ends up to be a big winning trade. You think it's because, because a couple of lines crossed, you know, no matter what it is, you know, whether it's stochastics or wise trade or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It had absolutely nothing to do with the reality of why the price has moved. Nothing. This is the primary characteristic that separates the professional from everyone else. What I just said right here. <laughs>